Good evening, everyone. We are grateful for your presence at this relevant event, which we will address a team that is embedded in education, in research and innovation, not only inside the university, but it goes beyond the walls and concerns all of us, the global community. To talk about the whole of the United Nations and the Sustainable Development Goals, we invite Professor Omar Hernandez, Public Information Officer at the United Nations Academic Impact, UNI. UNI aligns institutions of higher education with the United Nations in support and contributing to the realization of the United Nations goals and mandates, including the promotion of human rights, access to education, sustainability, and conflict resolution. On behalf of the Valley University, we welcome Professor Hernandez and would like to express the honor of having you here this evening, talking to our students and faculty about a topic we should all be committed to in order to reach a sustainable and peaceful world. To mediate this event, we invite Dr. Danielle Sika, professor at the Law School in the Valley. Professor Danielle, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and best wishes for a very successful and great event. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Paula. Good evening, everyone. I am Professor Daniel Sica da Cunha, Professor of Private International Law and Public International Law at Fevali University. I am also the leader of the project named Center for Legal Defense and Dissemination of Human Rights at Fevali University that brings free legal advice and free legal assistance for those who cannot afford to hire a lawyer uh, in a private way for a human rights cases. Today's lecture is part of Fevalis University's Human Rights and Black Consciousness Week, which is a traditional and annual academic event at our university to debate and raise awareness in the community about the importance of human rights at all levels. Today is about the university's commitment to the complete formation of the students and to the promotion of a democratic society which recognizes individual and collective rights, cultural diversity, and equality for all human beings. And no one better than Professor Omar Hernandez to share his knowledge and expertise with us today. I am truly honored to present to you today Professor Omar Hernandez, Professor Hernandez is a public information officer at the United Nations Academic Impact Initiative, and his focal point is on the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDG, and also on institutions of higher education. Previously, however, Professor Hernandez has served as a volunteer and conference management specialist at the United Nations Climate Change Secretariat and as a consultant for the Education for Justice initiative of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Moreover, Professor Hernandez volunteered with the Liaison Office of the United Nations Agency for Palestine Refugees and also with the World Federation of United Nations Associations, as well as for the United Nations Association of Venezuela. Furthermore, for almost five years, Professor Hernandez worked in his home country, Venezuela, as an international news analyst and editor in a local newspaper, including assignments as a temporary correspondent covering the Human Rights Council and the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. In addition to this, and also in Venezuela, Professor Hernandez taught for a decade and a half at the Andres Bello Catholic University courses of international journalism, international public law, and international human rights law, while providing training to civil society 
on UN human rights mechanisms and been an advisor of student delegations in Mother United Conferences. At the same time, he was an active member of the Academic Council of the United Nations System, conducting research on a wide range of issues on multilateral diplomacy and international affairs. Professor Omar has a master's degree in cooperation for development with the specialization in international humanitarian aid, a diploma of uh, advanced studies in freedom of expression and right to information, and a bachelor's degree in international studies. Professor Omar Hernandez, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. As I said earlier, it is a great honor for me and our students to learn from you today. The floor is yours, Professor, and welcome once again to Fevali University. Muito obrigado. Uh, boa noite a todos. É um prazer estar aqui com todos vocês. Um, it's certainly a privilege for me to speak on behalf of the United Nations Academic Impact to everybody over there in Brazil. Um, it is an honor as well because, as as, uh, as Professor Daniel mentioned, I used to be a university lecturer for for many years now, and um, it's always uh, good to to go back to the roots and to talk to students. Uh, particularly in uh, my current position as an uh, international civil servant and as a staff of the United Nations. I'm actually talking to you uh, from my office in the uh, United Nations headquarters in New York, a uh, building that I'm sure you're all familiar with the, on First Avenue in Manhattan with all the flags of all 193 member states. So it's certainly a privilege to work in a place like this. Uh, I just had a conversation just 10 minutes before joining this event with a colleague from Bolivia, another one from Russia. So everybody here is literally from everywhere. And I think this is another value that uh, places like these international organizations, but notably the United Nations, which is the only truly universal international organization there is. Um, the, the things that you learn, the, the knowledge you acquire, the experiences you share, the conversations you have with the colleagues, I think this is an added value. And also to know that you are working for ideals, for principles, for aspirations of mankind that everybody here share. And of course, uh, the United Nations have existed for a number of decades since its foundation in 1945. And I think the value of the United Nations is today greater than ever before. Um, of course, the context, uh, the circumstances, the interest, uh, behind uh, countries and nations are quite different from those that we found uh, at the middle of the 20th century. Many things have changed, and yet the United Nations is still here. The United Nations has been adapted to face current and ongoing challenges. And the fact that I am working actually with something called United Nations Academic Impact is quite unique. If you ask any of the, if I'm not mistaken, 51 countries that signed the United Nations Charter on 26 June 1945, a charter that was the, that entry into force, um, entry into force in, on 24th of October of the same year. If you ask delegates back then, do you think the universities, colleges, institutions for higher education in general are going to have any role whatsoever uh, in the United Nations? Probably the straight answer is, well, saying no, because the United Nations is an intergovernmental organization, it's an international organization composed of member states. Hence, if you're not a member state, if you're not a government that is, that is the, the actual representative, the legitimate representative of a member state, there's no place, there's no role, there's, there's nothing you can actually do inside of this building or beyond. Of course, over the decades, and particularly on issues such as sustainability and human rights, that conception that is centered around the nation state changed dramatically. And on this floor where I'm working, this is the ninth floor of the U.S. Secretariat building. Everybody who works on this particular building will deal with NGOs, civil society organizations that are advancing in the field all the ideas that the U.S. have. 
that are working with the UN and with the governments, even at the very local level, to make those ideas and principles of the UN a reality for the majority of the population in the field. We also work on this floor with uh, famous athletes, artists, such as Leonardo DiCaprio, that sat with the Secretary General Antonio Guterres during the recent uh, climate change conference in, in Glasgow, the COP26, because we need celebrities to be advocates of the things that we do and we, 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 we need to promote artists, singers, actors. BTS was here uh, early September ahead of the, of the, the high-level session of the GA, and uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, the video that they, they tweeted that was shot and filmed inside of the GA hall was seen at the very beginning for well, for more than two, three million people, um, which is a record for, for anything related to the United Nations. So of course we, we do use advocates and, and ambassadors of goodwill uh, to help us spread the message and in addition to those that have UNSCR with Angelina Jolie, UNICEF and so on. We also work with the media because the media, both traditional and social media, are quite relevant, particularly in times like this when we need to face and counter misinformation and disinformation in times of COVID-19. Climate change. And a number of challenges that are around the world. <clears throat> so I always want, uh, I always like, uh, because I am, I, I am not a lawyer, and yet I used to teach in, uh, in a law school international law. And of course, with the permission of Professor Daniel, at least in my home country, uh, uh, law professors and in general are bound by this notion that constitution is, you know, the top of the pyramid from a Colsenian uh, conception of law. And of course, when we see international law and the role of the United Nations, all these preconceptions about the structure of law, the hierarchy of law, are a little bit contradictory in itself. Or uh, to say the least, they make us think if we have international courts tribunals such as the International Criminal Court. Well, way before that, when we have the special courts to uh, prosecute crimes in former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Cambodia, and now within the International Criminal Court, in addition to the International Court of Justice that deals with uh, issues related to member states of the UN, those who have signed the status of the International Court of Justice. When we have, uh, and we are seeing this right now, uh, and I, I am not speaking on behalf of the UN, by the way, I'm speaking on, on my own behalf, uh, on my personal capacity. When we, we think these things happening in Eastern Europe with Poland, with, uh, Poland and, and Belarus and the situation with the Court of Justice in, in Poland and the, the rulings of the uh, EU judicial institutions and this, this balance between the sovereignty and the acceptance of EU law, when we see, this, when we see all these debates, then we have to think about, okay, what is, what is the role of international public law? And I'm not going to go, because we, we can speak like for hours and hours about that. And uh, the, the, as, as I used to say in my classroom, international law, international public law in particular, because international private law is quite different, but international public law, there is no yes and no answers. The, 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 I mean, most of the things that I used to ask my students, the answers were, a, yes, B, no, C, well, it depends. So, it, I mean, everything you do in international public law has a very strong link with international politics, which is completely beyond law. When we think about politics, ideologies, systems of government, geopolitics, the role of international economics, trade. So there are all these variables that somehow impact and influence how international public law is produced, is developed, and more importantly, is implemented. Um, because of course, it all depends uh, of the will of member states with very few exceptions concerning international peace and security, uh, members of the UN, but in, in things that are not necessarily related to international peace and security, the actual implementation of decisions, of resolutions of the United Nations, basically rise on the goodwill of member states. And this is relevant for what I'm going to say a few times. So when we think about the United Nations, this wasn't uh, an innovative idea. This wasn't the, an original idea. We had something before that. We have the League of Nations 
after World War One, even before that, in the American continent, we already had the the predecessor of the current Constitution of, of American states. And in Europe, we have many other similar regional organizations. So the idea of member states coming together goes back even for the times of Napoleon uh, and, the, and the Congress of Vienna, 1840 and then 1815. So this is not a new idea because when we have common problems, we need common solutions. When we have shared concerns, we also have shared interests. So this is the basic idea behind multilateralism. Multilateralism is not to forget the fact that every member state of the United Nations or any other regional organization is sovereign, is bound by its own rules, its own hierarchy of law, its own constitution. I mean, the, the existence of multilateralism is not against that. It's actually a reinforcement of national sovereignty because you need to be a sovereign state in order to be a member of a multilateral organization. And in that sense, multilateral institutions actually help, assist, to advance their own purposes and ideals of each one of the provisions we're talking about. So, of course, when the League of Nations was created after one, uh, and the birth of the League of Nations was very flawed. So, of course, the League of Nations faced a number of challenges, including, I wouldn't say that's the most important part of the story, but probably it had a major impact the fact that the United States, which was the country that suggested, proposed, and fought for the creation of the League of Nations back in the uh, famous Palace of Versailles in Paris, the United States wasn't a member of the League of Nations that it proposed because of the denial that was uh, obtained by the Congress of the United States. And hence, uh, and after that, it, it was uh, a domino effect that, of course, the main purpose of the League of Nations was to avoid um, a non-conflict of global scale worse than the, than the previous one, the Great War or World War I. But actually, we all know by now and the result was catastrophic because World War II was actually worse than the first one, not, not only in terms of numbers of countries uh, that were affected, numbers of countries that participated, and most importantly, perhaps for all of us, the damage not only in infrastructure, but also in, when it comes to fundamental freedoms and human rights in a number of places around the world, including in this continent, on, and on this continent, in many parts of it, uh, so the devastation was so severe that when the war was, wasn't even over, World War, World War II, so some countries, namely the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, and the Soviet Union back then came, came together and said, you know what, let's revisit the idea of an international organization. Let's, let's see what, what worked, because there were some things that actually worked uh, during, the, the, during the, the brief existence of the League of Nations. Then let, let us rethink. And actually, the term United Nations is not an original term in itself because it came from a treaty that was signed between those three powers. And they decided, actually, the very first uh, conference that was uh, in San Francisco here in the United States, it was called the International Conference about the International Organization, but there wasn't even a name for the United Nations. So this, this name was, was taken and actually, I'm professor, I think you will agree on this. The actual name nations is might be contested because technically speaking, the UN is not composed of nations but of states, and there's a huge difference. And we can talk about for days and hours, days and weeks, months and years about the difference between a state and a nation. But anyhow, now that we came to this realization, okay, we need to have an organization that is that, and we need, of course, a founding treaty which is the, the United Nations Charter that was signed initially by 51 states, and now we have 193 member states. Um, so the fact that the membership has grown that much, in itself is a success. It's a demonstration of the value of the United Nations. So probably, I don't know if students that are here know this, Whenever a state declares independence, the very first thing they do before they even ask for international recognition is to ask membership 
uh, at the United Nations because automatically, if you're a member of the UN, of course you are an independent and sovereign member state. This is the very first thing. Probably even in less than 48 hours, all men or aspiring uh, independent and sovereign states do apply for membership at the United Nations. So the fact that you have the flag on First Avenue here or on the United Nations, which, by the way, the UN, although it's headquartered here in New York, we also have very large conference venues uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, in Vienna, Austria, in Bonn, Germany, and also in Nairobi, Kenya. These are the, the, large, the very large uh, venues for the United Nations. So when we read the United Nations Charter, I will concentrate my 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 views on the very first two articles. Actually, before we go there, I will concentrate on the preamble, which I already refer to. Because the preamble, and this is very interesting, the preamble, I mean, again, this was signed and adopted in a conference of state representatives back in 1945. And yet, when we read the preamble, and, you know, uh, the, the, the whole rationale behind the the peoples of the United Nations. And this is critical. This is vital because it doesn't say we member states. It doesn't say we the governments. It doesn't say we the diplomats. It says we the peoples. Meaning that the United Nations is our organization. And by our I mean my organization and your organization. And we have to we have to understand that fact. Although we, we, when we see intergovernmental bodies here, of course, we see diplomats and representatives from governments of states that are actually part of the United Nations. In the end, the United Nations is a treasure, is a, is a, is a, is an entity that belongs and responds to mankind. And this is critical to understand why over the, over the years, there has been an increase in the access to media, NGOs, universities, schools, researchers, and so on. We even have uh, a formula called the ARIA formula in the Security Council that allows people that are not a part of the, of the United Nations whatsoever, they do not represent any country, they can actually meet with members of the UN in this formula called the ARIA formula, and they can meet outside of the security chamber and brief member states. And that person can be a priest, which is actually how he started back in the in the nineties when the when the former Yugoslavia was under this uh, this uh, complex and complicated armed conflict. You can have people from NGOs. You can have people literally from everywhere briefing member states at the security council, but not at the security council chamber or hall. So we have created all these formulas and ideas because we need, actually, I would say confidently, the United Nations need more about your actions, your thoughts, and your ideas. We need you more than you need us. Because the ideas, the innovation, the pressure, um, the influence that people have on the UN cannot be diminished. When we have seen, and I worked myself in, in the UN Climate Change Secretariat in Germany uh, a few years ago, I could see firsthand the power, the lives of the people. So we need to understand what the role of the United Nations is, what we can do, how can we do it better, and what is your role? What are you going to do to help us deliver? Because when we deliver, we're delivering not to ourselves and not to member states, we're delivering for the whole world. Think about the very first part of Article 1 of the United Nations Charter that reads, maintenance of international peace and security. Of course, we cannot deny that the United Nations was, bo was born uh, and raised in the aftermath of World War II. So, of course, the first thing that was in everybody's mind back then, okay, we need to, we need to ensure that this will not happen again. And although it is pretty obvious that we, we, uh, we have a number of armed conflicts at the regional, national, sub-national, and local level in many parts of the world, we haven't had any World War III. 
And actually, I, I, rem I remember a quote that, if I'm not mistaken, is attributed to Albert Einstein. He said, I'm not, I don't know how World War III is going to be fought, but I know World War IV is going to be fought with stones because the world will be devastated. The United Nations has been successful on that. And we continue to read the United Nations Charter, and it talks about cooperation. And I believe the word cooperation here is critical because we know, of course, that not all members of the UN are equal. There, there are significant differences in terms of GDP, financial resources, military power, uh, population. Just imagine some, some member states of the UN concentrate more than half of uh, a handful of member states of the UN actually concentrate more than half of the world's financial resources. Well, also, only a handful of members of the U.S. concentrate more than half of the world's population. And we can go over and over and, you know, variable by variable, and we're going to see there are many significant gaps. There is a member state of the U.N., and I'm, I'm not going to quote any name, but uh, this is a homework for, for the students. Just, just for you to know the difference between member states, and yet, Article 2 says, all member states of the UN are equal, and uh, they are the sovereign member states are equal and need to be treated as equal. Hence, the vote of a big power equals exactly the same as the vote of a country that might be perceived as a, uh, a developing country, Ex with the exception of the Security Council, and I'm sure you'll cover this uh, when, when, when you get to that in your classes. But this country that you are going to have homework of finding out who, which country it is, has so very little resources that one, one, one of the sources of more income for this country is selling out uh, internet domain. So their country, of course, in the case of, of Brazil, if I'm not mistaken, is BR. So this country sells on a regular basis their 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 internet domain to receive income so and that this this is one of the biggest income for this particular country because they have nothing else of course you cannot compare that with a country like brazil with so many vast natural resources of the united states or any other country in the western in the western world so i give you the homework for you i'm sure you'll be surprised to find out so and yet cooperation is indeed relevant because if we, for example, when we talk about human rights, and we, in particular when we talk about economic, social, and cultural rights that speak about right to education, right to health, right to uh, have a decent life, how can we expect a country with a, a negligible GDP, with a GDP per capita that is almost non existent? that has been a country devastated by war and natural disasters. And we can think about, for example, the, the region of, of the Sahel in Africa. How can we expect that a country like that, and with political uncertainty and instability over the past years or even decades, how can we expect that country to just achieve their goals uh, to provide their own population with their economic, social, and cultural rights without any assistance whatsoever from abroad. It's possible. Which is why the United Nations Charter, since its very beginning, since its foundation, set the tone for that. And it clearly said we need international cooperation and solidarity to solve the problem. And the United Nations, the United Nations Charter is very clear. Actually, I'll be with your. Uh, I, I'm going to. About what I'm talking about in the United States, because the United States was drafted, of course, and many uh, failures in the that led to it. So, when we have, for example, Article, uh, Article 3, I'm sorry, Article 1.3, to achieve international cooperation in solving international problems. So, this is again very critical. It's not cooperative just for the sake of solidarity and collaboration. It has a purpose. And the purpose is solving 
problems. Imagine the problems that the world had in 1945 compared to the problems that we have right now. For instance, the word environment doesn't appear at all in the UN Charter. It's very hard to find it. And yet, we cannot see uh, UN without being uh, involved in solving environmental problems such as the degradation of the soil, climate change, pollution of the seas, and so on. Because either they were not a problem considered as such back in 1945, or simply these problems did not exist back then. Now they do. For the same reason that back in the days, who could sp speak about the internet and the right to information and communication technologies? Now we do speak about it, and some people even say that's a human right in itself. It used to be tied to the, to the human right or the freedom of speech and access to information, and it has derived in all this, uh, what somebody called a uh, fourth generation group of, or set of human rights. Let me continue with the UN Charter. Now, between Article, um, sorry, uh, article Point 1 and Point 3, we have Point 2. Develop friendly relations among nations based on the respect of the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples. But at the end of Article 1, probably is for me, and this is a very personal appreciation, the article reads, to be a center for harmonizing the actions of nations. And for me, this is the value of the UN itself. Member states come here acknowledging and knowing in advance that they have differences of opinion, of criteria, uh, con contested uh, solutions and proposals. Um, some of them are enemies, some of them do not like each other, some of them do not even have diplomatic and consular relations, and yet they come here to try to harmonize the action. So the UN is a catalyst of diplomacy. So this is the, the, the whole idea behind multilateral diplomacy. Multilateral diplomacy does not mean that we live in, a, in an utopia in which we are all, all peace lover nations and we don't have any problems whatsoever. And this, this Wilsonian idea that the war is just, you know, a, a group of uh, uh, nations aspiring to, to, you know, to boost the extent possible international and global solidarity. But the war is not, as the real politic would say, a world full of countries that only pursue their own national interests and nobody cares about nobody else. And uh, the sort of whole existence or, 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 or or founding principles of the United Nations is just a joke for those who believe that. I think the world is not as bad as the real politics uh, puts it, and it's not the utopia that the idealism from Wilson days, uh, Wilson, former president of the US, that uh, was the man behind the idea of the League of Nations, uh, once spoke about it. I think the actual world, the contemporary world, is something in between. But nonetheless, the UN does its best with the limited resources that we have to advance those purposes and to advance those purposes through the implementation and application of some ideals. Ideals that are enshrined in Article 2. Sovereign equality of all its members. Fulfillment in good faith of the obligations. And this is something critical. Um, in pretty much all the countries of the world, the fulfillment of your legal obligations is not left to the good faith of the citizens. Either you fulfill them or you don't fulfill them. And if you don't fulfill them, then there are consequences for you. But what, do, what you can do to a member state, because the members, I mean, the, the whole the member state, uh, the, the whole idea of the state, the state is a fiction, it's a legal fiction. We cannot touch the state. We, we can touch ourselves. We can, we, we can touch an animal. We can touch a house. We cannot touch the state. 
we can we, we can feel the state and we can feel the impact and the influence of the state but we can the exist the state does not exist in physical terms hence it is absolutely impossible to apply the same rational idea behind law that normally is applicable when we talk about domestic law when we talk about international law we have this concept and this is not a concept by the way just to make not a concept that is a concept that the internet has not has embraced but it's a concept as old as international law is which is a concept that is actually enshrined also in the uh, Vienna Convention on the Law of the Treaties. Bona fide pacta sub servanda. We, we, we have to assume, this is a Latin phrase, by the way, uh, this, we have to assume that member states or treaty, I'm sorry, uh, parties to a treaty, in this case, the United Nations Charter, which in itself is a treaty. So we have to assume that, me, that states that signed and ratify that are going to actually fulfill their obligations in accordance with the provisions of such treaty in good faith. Some people might say, oh, this is very naive. And yet, this is the actual reality. This is how multilateral organizations work. Probably not the way the European Union works, because they have developed uh, some, um, I would call them, countermeasures to ensure that it's not only good faith, uh, the thing that guarantees uh, the fulfillment of obligations as per European conventions, but at the at the United Nations level, we are we are uh, far behind that um, for a number of reasons. Uh, as of now, the United Nations, uh, just to demythify any conspiracy theory about the United Nations, we are not the center of a new world order. This is not a world government. This is not uh, a world executive power. It's a multilateral, international, intergovernmental organization, meaning that all decisions are taken by member states of the United Nations. We can, of course, provide guidance. We can, of course, add, uh, advance uh, what we think are the papers and ideas after the United Nations Charter because we have nothing else. Uh, but in the end, it, it, it all comes to the political will of member states. And the, even that assumption that might not necessarily be uh, the best outcome is actually enshrined and, and considered as such in the United Nations Order itself. Um, over the past few years, we have seen that, for example, and I'm going to elaborate more on Article 1.3, when it says international cooperation to solve problems, we could see 60s, 70s, 80s were dominated by sadly the division of power between two blocks during the Cold War that wasn't that cold in many parts of the world, but that's a discussion for another class. But anyhow, when the Berlin Wall fall, uh, fell, of course, and Fukuyama, if I'm not mistaken, said, "Well, this is the end of this is the end of everything. Now that everything is solved, no, well, everything is not solved. Now we have new problems, and we have new challenges that come with those problems." So the United Nations had to redefine itself, had to rethink about the problems that the world currently faces at the regional, national, and international level. So at some point, we came up with this idea of the Millennium Development Goals, uh, because of course, with the beginning of the 21st century, there are many problems and many challenges, and there were these ideas and these conceptions. And you know, when we talk about uh, development, development usually in the in the mindset of the general population was usually tied to the concept of economic development, meaning that the larger or the bigger the GDP is, the more developed our country is. It was a very simple explanation, a very simple concept that pretty much everybody understood. So if you are if you're wealthy if you if you have enough financial resources if your if your trade balance is good you are a developed country and that's about it no more discussion the same um, simplicity applies to the concept of sustainability 
So Senariti was 100% of the time, and even uh, even today, some people actually think about sustainability that way. If you say the word sustainable, people think in, a, in the jungle, in the Amazon, in a bird, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a in a on a fish, a whale. So for more, for I, I will say a large majority of the population, sustainability has an environmental connotation and uh, somehow tied with ecology or the protection of the forest or the skies. Uh, or disease and doesn't go beyond that. So it is purely environmental. So when we see the sustainable development goals and we see the concept of sustainable development, of course, this changes all. I mean, what I just said is completely behind the wall. And we have a new term, and we have a new concept. And that new concept came together in 2015. Uh, not that long ago, with the emergence of the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, the important part here is the Sustainable Development Goals are goals that are supposed to be met by 2030. We are almost in 2022, some weeks from now. So it is almost around the corner, and this includes the couple of years in which we are still are, of the COVID-19 pandemic that all, of course, set us back to times pre-COVID and many advancements that were achieved in many parts of the world, naturally they set off off the track of uh, advancement and fulfillment of those goals and achievement of those goals. More importantly, if you read the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda, there are two things that are important. The first one, that most people tend to, which I mean, I can understand that. Most people tend to read the 2030 agenda just in the section that is entirely about the goals themselves, but they don't read what is behind that or before that. And before that, this is very important because the word academia appears many times. And this is important because academia is not something that is referred to as part of a list. Academia is considered, and I am quoting the Sustainable Development adopted by member states of the United Nations, is a valuable stakeholder. Meaning that academia is not merely to teach about the SDGs, and that's about it. Of course, this is important. This, uh, the, the education component of teaching about the SDGs is important, but also it's awareness, advocacy creating solutions, proposing solutions, connecting with each other. So here the role of global academic co cooperation that we at the United Nations Academic Keeper, we try to foster and motivate and inspire. I have seen firsthand from here, from my office in New York, so many wonderful examples of what universities are doing. Just, I mean, when, when we talk about COVID-19 pandemic, let, let us refer to just that, just because we all know this context, because we are all facing it. I have seen universities producing <laughs> sorry, protective equipment for frontline uh, people working in hospitals. I have seen universities that with their labs are producing hand sanitizers. I have seen universities that have provided uh, equipment to their students and professors to continue education via virtual uh, platforms. I have seen universities that have produced uh, tests to diagnose COVID-19. Uh, for example, I have, I have a university in Korea that developed what they call a nano-PCR. Exactly the same as a regular PCR that gives results in 17 minutes. I have universities that are researching about experimental modes to counter the disease once the person gets it. I have universities that have researched the socioeconomic impact of lockdowns and other measures taken by government. I have universities researching about misinformation and disinformation and about vaccination hesitancy in, in many countries. And how to counter and 
how to challenge that. So, of course, I'm talking about a very wide range of initiatives carried out by universities just with in relation to COVID 19 pandemic. So, the, and then I'm, I always say that I might be biased because I was a professor myself. So, of course, I come from academia, but I cannot stress this enough. The value, just imagine a place with all this knowledge, all this expertise concentrated in professors, lecturers, researchers, scientists, in addition to the power, the innovation, the idealism of students, both on the undergraduate and graduate level, even on the uh, PhD level. But universities are not silos. Universities are, have a very wide range of partnerships with civil society in the communities around them with local governments. I mean, imagine there's no other institution in the entire world that has all this potential. Universities do. Because university can, universities also train teachers of primary and secondary school. So it has a domino effect. All the teachers all around the world that teach little kids are trained and educated in schools of education that are housed in universities. So, of course, the effect multiplies. Just the action of one student, just the action of one professor can influence, motivate, can mobilize civil society, local governments, private sector, small businesses, and beyond. Imagine if you harness that power and imagine if a university works with another university and so on. The power is immense. Power is even greater than we can think about. So when we think about the SDGs, <clears throat> please read first the text that is behind and before the actual goal. Because there is a very concrete reference to academia. Now if we transition to the actual goals, we have 17 goals. And each one of those goals has a set of indicators. And this is very important because perhaps if perhaps if we if we if we say something like we have to uh, enhance global cooperation, that's a very abstract concept. There's no way to actually measure that. But when you have indicators, there are numbers that you need to provide. There are stories that you need to tell. And we have in the UN. Uh, the voluntary national reviews that are taken by member states in consultation with their own local national stakeholders to tell the world what the state is doing to actually achieve the SDGs. Because this is, this, this is a race um, that is urgent. As many people and activists said during the COP26 in Glasgow just a few days ago, uh, there is no planet B. And that applies to a number of things, not only climate change, but all the things that are covered in the SDGs, starting with the most obvious, poverty. While we are sitting here, and while I'm giving this lecture to you, many people are dying from preventable diseases. While I'm here talking to you, many people are starving and getting it at all these days. While we are here, many people are fleeing their countries because they're being either prosecuted by the, their government, armed groups, or because they're starving, or because as happens in some countries in Africa and the Pacific, it's simply impossible to live there because of the environmental conditions. While we are here, Many people are suffering because of the, they are being deprived from the human rights and fundamental freedoms, something that actually is covered in SDG 16, of peace, justice, and strong institutions. While we are here, the biodiversity is being critically attacked by these patterns of consumption, uh, by these economic models that do not take into account the protection of the environment. 
and some species are basically going to be lost. So plant species and animal species are going to be lost entirely forever just because of this. And we, we still don't know the impact that that might have in the future. Not, not of the future generations of our present generation. While we are here, in many countries of the world, women are being deprived of their rights. Something like gender equality is, is just a dream for many women and girls that don't even have access to schools. And we know, I'm not going to again mention any country in particular, but we know news that are very recent from some country that, you know, created this concern that was already there in the, in the global arena. What, what about the future of these women and girls? While we are here, earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes, and a wide range of natural disasters are affecting the most vulnerable populations. There's always an example of the earthquake. There's, there's a reason why, for example, a country such as Japan, that is prone to have earthquakes uh, a number of times during the year, whenever it's hit by a very big earthquake, quickly recovers after it. Not the same case for Haiti, not far from where, where I am and you are. But, is less uh, aggressive than the one in Japan creates so much damage. So many deaths. There's a reason for that. While we are here, many people are unemployed. Many people do not have, do not have access to medical medical, the minimum medical services. So when we think about what happens while we are here, the idea is not to be sensationalist, it's just plain true. Probably if you go now after this lecture, you open, um, you go to the bathroom or the kitchen, you have water, running water. This is a dream for many people that have to, to walk even 5, 10 kilometers just, just for a bunch of uh, recipients with water. And it's not even treated water. It's not potable water. Just imagine the realities that are present in many corners of the world. Some of them appear on the news, most of them not. So when we think about the role of the United Nations and multilateral institutions, yes, we need to debate. Yes, we need to talk. Yes, we need to negotiate. And I refer back to the UN Charter itself, which Article 1.4 says the United Nations needs to be a center for harmonizing. Allow me to quote that properly. Um, harmonizing the actions is not to harmonize the talks, is not to harmonize the policies, is not to harmonize the debates, it's to harmonize the actions. So this is why I always, I, I used to repeat to my students a, a number of times, read the words carefully. So it's not cooperation just for the sake of cooperate, it's to solve problems. And it's not to harmonize just because everybody com is coming here in an ideal world. No, we take member states come here to harmonize actions. And this is a very important word also because since last year we are in the decade of action for the SDGs. And there's a reason why the United Nations is so, so eager and so strong about this. The time to theorize, to talk, to debate, to make a philosophy about the SDGs, that time has passed. This is behind us. The time now is to act. The girl that cannot go to school, the man that cannot find a job, the women that do not have access to healthcare, that is not considered a human being because for the only reason that she's a woman, the person that doesn't have a shelter, the person that is poor, that is starving, the person that wants freedom of expression and yet all his or her human rights and fundamental freedoms are completely violated. That person cannot wait. And that person is, just, is not just one person. That person is 
hundreds, thousands of women, of migrants, of refugees, of vulnerable people, indigenous people, minorities. I mean, when we think about a number, perhaps doesn't say that much. But when we put faces and names to those numbers, when we read the stories, and we, this is why when you read stories about that from the UN, we always want to, you know, put a face and a name to the situation because otherwise it's just a number, it's just a figure that doesn't take that much. Probably you can find yourself how many people at this hour in just one minute have died, left. Uh, I don't know, is starving. I mean, the numbers are of concern, but we are sometimes in our own bubble and we, we just forget about what's happening outside of the world. But the world is there. It's outside of, it's outside of your house, outside of your, your university. So what I want to stress is that, yes, the United Nations was created with a purpose, or actually a set of purposes, but it's also the responsibility of civil society it is also the responsibility of universities to make sure that these purposes and principles are not forgotten. Or the opposite, that they have to make sure that these principles, these goals, the sustainable development goals, which are for all of us, are actually fulfilled by 2030, if not before that. And my student might say, rightly so, okay, how do I do that? Educate others. Create advocacy, awareness, outreach, train yourself, work with an NGO, work with your university. And in case somebody is asking, particularly those studying law or international relations or international human rights law, you can work with the United Nations and you can make a difference here. But you, you don't have to actually be here to make a difference. You can make a difference from where you are right now. And there are a number of, of means to do that. You just have to ask the right people. And you have to motivate yourself to do that. You have to inspire others with all this technology that we have right now to connect each other. I have seen so many good projects and I, I, I we have partnered with so many people. And again, the role of universities and the Valley University is one of them, is, is critical in this sense. This is why we were created, we, the UN Academic Impact, back in 2010, by former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Yes, what, why, why, why we don't create a network of universities to do that? And um, as of now, we have 1,512 universities and colleges in 145 member states of the U.S. And I read emails and reports every single day for at least a dozen of universities around the world. And we create these projects and we tailor communication materials and we create special series of articles, podcasts, interviews, webinars, including a couple of Portuguese, uh, a very recent one on sustainable cities and communities just a few weeks ago. So we do our best to, to engage universities, to connect with academia, we do our part. I kindly ask you to, to inspire yourself, to motivate yourself, to realize that when you speak about international public law, you're in reality speaking about a, a whole new world, completely away from domestic law, completely away from your local realities. Um, when you, when you, See, for example, the work of the wonderful components of the UN system, because the UN is not just this building. The UN is also UNICEF, UNSCR, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organizations, International Civil Aviation Organization, the World Food Program, the, the Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. So the UN is pretty much everywhere. UNESCO. Fairbairn University follows guidelines from UNESCO uh, that, that were drafted by UNESCO when it comes to higher education. The schools where you did your high school and primary school are also following guidelines 
from UNESCO. This is us, the United Nations. So the United Nations is everywhere. And again, it, it all happened from the very beginning because of the United Nations Charter. Today, the UN system, as we call it, is composed of a, a number of special agencies, funds, programs, institutes, even universities that work together to advance the ideas and purposes of the UN under the UN umbrella. For many people around the world, just to see the UN flag is a symbol of hope. It's a symbol of uh, humanism. For example, many of you probably by now are, are tired of, of hearing about one of our uh, organizations, the World Health Organization, WHO in Geneva, because of course, with COVID-19, WHO is, is pretty much one of the key players to, to promote vaccination, to promote measures to counter, and ultimately we hope to, to eliminate the, the threat of the COVID-19 disease. And uh, again, let us, I mean, I let me tell you a little bit of a story. The first time I came to this building, I was 11 years old. Um, I came with my parents, of course, as a tourist. And I remember uh, the guy uh, that was uh, the tour guide, which, by the way, the digital services section is actually housed on this floor, um, uh, on this division. Um, the guy asked the group of tourists, uh, who knows which is the first flag on First Avenue? And I raised my hand and I said, of course, Afghanistan. Okay, which is the last one? I said, of course, Zimbabwe. So people were surprised that 11 year old knew these uh, fun facts from the UN. And I remember a couple of people approached my parents and told them, you know, maybe your kid should study international relations or law. Maybe he, didn't, he might end up working in the UN someday. And here I am, I, I'm not going to say how many years uh, after that, but uh, here I am many decades later. Um, and uh, every time I come to this building, and when I used to work in the UN in, in, in Bonn also, um, and even when I was a correspondent at the UN in Geneva, when I see this, the fact of the UN and the facts of all members say, this is, this is both of us are very privileged enough to work here. Um, we do it because we firmly believe in the ideas of the UN, um, of world peace, uh, international security, human rights, economic development. So, and I think these are, these are ideals that are not exclusive of the UN. I believe every human person and every human being around the world has the same ideas, probably from different angles, perspectives, and with different considerations in mind. But I think mankind as a whole, uh, despite of the political, ideological, religious, cultural differences, even like language barriers, I think we'll come together here uh, to do the work uh, in favor of the world and in favor of ourselves. And I remember when I was a student myself, I would participate in a Modi UN conference in Geneva uh, when I crossed the flags uh, in the Palais des Nations uh, in, over there in Geneva. I said, I need to work here at some point. So I did my best to, to, to achieve that. And um, here I am, again, inspiring students, uh, in this case from a, a country that is very beloved to uh, to my country, Venezuela, which is Brazil. Uh, and uh, we used to support uh, the, the La, La Vera Marela in the, in the World Cup of football. And uh, so we are, we are a very proud neighbor of Brazil, so a very good friend of Brazil, despite the language barrier. And um, please do not hesitate to reach out to me through the authorities of the university. And I'm here for any questions you might have uh, about anything I have said. So with that, I, I will stop here and thank you very much. Professor Omar, I'd like to thank you for your time, for your passion and willingness to share with the Valley University students uh, your knowledge and experience about the role of the United Nations and also about the SDGs. I couldn't agree more, Professor, with all that was said. Uh, also, uh, the role of academia in bringing up solutions to global problems and not only criticizing uh, or pointing out those problems. 
I always remember uh, Mr. Kofi Annan, former Secretary General of the United Nations, in one well-known of his speeches in 2002, one year after September 11th, in which he stated that the global interest is our national interest. So each country and each one of us are part of the world and we need to understand that in a legal way, uh, as you said, it is time to act, it is time to implement rights. It was amazing, uh, it was an amazing lecture and I'm sure that many students here are now even more interested in the subject uh, and are understanding how uh, the human rights subject truly affects all humankind everywhere. So, so thank you for, for your lecture. Well, uh, we still have some time for questions from the audience. Uh, do we have any question here? We have a comment here, very inspirational lecture, they're saying. Any questions from the audience? If I, if I may uh, add something, uh, because you are, you are uh, doing this in the framework of, uh, if I understand correctly, the Human Rights Week, and the Human Rights Day is just around the corner on 10 December when we celebrate the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it happened that not, not only I work with many NGOs back in the home country, but also I, uh, as you mentioned during my uh, uh, introduction, um, I cover as a, as a correspondent the Human Rights Council in Geneva, so I saw firsthand many discussions about human rights. Um, but of course, this is an intergovernmental body with you know all the in national interest present when, when the discussions on human rights arise. And I was also there when uh, my own country was under review during the session of economic, 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 social, and cultural rights. So, uh, during those discussions, it was very clear to me from the very beginning that the role, particularly when we speak about, about human rights, the role, the role of organized civil society, but civil society in general, is critical because it is only through civil society that we know the actual reality on the ground. We can, we can find solutions to the challenges that can be present. And, you know, I always say, uh, when, when I used to teach international human rights law, of course, you have the, the obligations of the states. Really, if I, in international human rights law, the obligation to, uh, to train law enforcement the obligation to legislate in favor of human rights, the obligation of, uh, in case of a uh, uh, violation of human rights, to investigate, to, to make a, to sanction the individual respond uh, that, that, you know, uh, found guilty of those. And of course, uh, to make the, the reverse as, as, you know, as provided in law. However, I always said, you know, which is the most important state obligation to human rights? to educate about human rights. And this, this, the reason is very simple and it cannot be simpler. If you don't know which are your rights, how are you going to defend them? And I'll stop here. That's perfect, Professor. We have a question from the audience here. Uh, uh, it's written right here as you comment about the indicators of the SDG and Agenda 2030. I'd like to know how UNI controls the indicators of the 17 SDG in the universities. Um, well, this, this is a very pertinent question, uh, very timely as well, because we normally, until this point, our focus was to provide training, um, not training, but to, to promote awareness on the SDGs and we reported, uh, we received reports from many universities around the world what they were doing on the SDGs. And we highlighted that through our reports and, and social media and web page. Uh, but now we are transitioning to something new. Um, so this is a, you are probably the first person of this floor that's going to, to know all this. So we are going to have a workshop, uh, an SDGs workshop on uh, early December next month precisely to train and to provide guidance to universities on how universities can measure on their own what they are doing to actually accomplish and achieve the SDGs on campus and beyond. And we have a couple of examples from universities in the US. 
and we, we want to hear about community from all over the world about that. So there's going to be a, a best practices sharing, if I may. Mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect. Well, that, that uh, uh, let us remind the importance of universities and, as you said, civil society in order to achieve those goals and not only expecting states to do their part. It's uh, a global problem, a common problem that demands common solutions and uh, that, that demands that every, everyone is engaged to try to make them happen in, in real life. Professor, from your lecture, uh, uh, I had several thoughts and uh, ideas that popped into my head. And I have a question of my own, if you don't mind. Sure. Sure. Uh, I was thinking about uh, the present and about the difficulties that the pandemic brought to the implementation of the SDGs. And you have addressed the pandemic situation during your lecture. Although one cannot predict the future, I'd like to hear from you how do you see the role of the United Nations in the coming years? Even more, is there a possibility that the SDGs can be changed to a lower level or the pandemic only reinforces the importance of maintaining the goals and increasing efforts to achieve them? Uh, what would be your thoughts on, on that? I mean, uh, we don't know what's going to happen after 2030, for sure. But we do know that 2030 is still the deadline uh, to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. And, as you rightly said, the ongoing pandemic has demonstrated, uh, probably in a very harsh way, how important it is to to when we when we do decision making and when we when we design policies and when we implement those policies to to take into account the needs uh, of the ones who suffer the most, the needs of the most vulnerable ones, and uh, the indicators are not going to be changed. Uh, so if we cannot change the indicators, if we cannot change the deadline. What we need to do is just speed it up the process. So actually, the last uh, session of the DA, which is still ongoing, uh, started with the high-level segment in September. Um, you know, it was very clear from all the statements from all, pretty much all member states, that we need to do more, and we need to do more right now, um, because those who were poor before the pandemic are poorer right now. Uh, those who were in a critical situation back then are in a worse situation right now. So I think because of that, we need urgent decisions and we need even more urgent actions. Um, so the sustainable development goals basically now have a perhaps a tougher framework uh, or context to be worked on. But this 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 is the momentum. This is this is the time. I mean, uh, it's very easy when nothing is going on. It's, it's harder when a lot of things are happening. So we we need to uh, we need to do things, we need to think strategically, but we need to do it fast, quick, and with a human heart, uh, because we have to put the human being at the center. And as we, as we say in the UN, to leave no one, no one behind. And unfortunately, as of now, many people, it's very hard. Okay, good. Do we have uh, any questions from the audience? Another question? Okay, otherwise I have a final question. <laughs> Professor uh, Omar, uh, I believe that many people uh, here in the audience are amazed and delighted with the work of the United Nations and with your professional experience and your uh, passion, passion in talking about the United Nations. Uh, the United Nations seem to be part of your life since you're very young, since you were at least 11. So uh, uh, probably many people here in the audience uh, have this dream of working for the United Nations also, or uh, being part of this uh, international organization. So Professor Omar, if you could tell us a little bit about the process of hiring professionals 
or even in terms by the United Nations, I think that would be something of interest. Sure. Um, that's a very good question, but with a very complex answer. I'll do my best to, to, to summarize to the best of my abilities that. Um, well, first of all, we need to understand that the UN is a system. Uh, hence, every single specialized agency, fund, program, institute has a distinct human rights, I'm sorry, human resource uh, process. Having said that, usually it follows the same rules and guidelines across the UN system. Um, so there are many avenues to get a job at the UN. Uh, you can be a national staff if you're working, if you're talking in this case about the UN in Brazil. You can be an international staff is when you move uh, overseas, uh, for example, to come to New York. Um, you need to have, a, uh, you can be a, a junior professional officer. In this case, if the government of Brazil is willing to pay the salary of the person to promote that person. Uh, you can be, uh, 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 you know, a YPP, as they call it here, which is through an exam that is advertised uh, once in a while during the course of the year um, for entry-level positions. You can be a consultant, an individual contractor. Uh, I think I have been all of those things, by the way. Um, you can be a United Nations volunteer, which is for the UND uh headquarters in Bonn, and they assign you to work normally in field positions. Um, actually, in Brazil, they offer quite a lot of positions for as a UND, and you work directly with the staff of the concerned organization of the UN. And uh, once in a while, they even ask for Portuguese-speaking people to work in Portuguese-speaking countries in Africa, such as Mozambique, uh, Angola, uh, Guinea-Bissau, and so on. Uh, so that might be an opportunity there. Um, I mean, um, I'm more than, I mean, I don't want to commit anybody, but I am uh, able to uh, connect with my colleagues of human resources, and they have actually they has posted these uh, trainings and uh, not a training, sorry, uh, webinars for people in Brazil. So uh, if this is this is something of interest for Febale University, we can arrange that with my colleagues from Human Resources that are more well-versed in, in all the different avenues to get a job at the UN. Um, and as an intern, um, you know, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, there are some restrictions to come to the office, uh, but that have been gradually being eliminated, though. But some offices, including ourselves, are, are, are recruiting interns from uh, all over the world to work remotely. Uh, so this is also an option. Uh, many offices, not only ours, but many offices in the UN here and abroad uh, are also doing that. But I will, I mean, we can talk later about the many different avenues, and I, I you know, I bring myself to do that and to connect with uh, my colleagues in human resources, uh, and not to step into anyone's toes. But uh, as a as a as a personal, you know, on a personal perspective or view, I will have some suggestions for us, uh, you know, aspirants to be part of the UN. First and foremost, you have to speak at least two of the official languages of the UN. Um, this is very important. And by speak, I mean speak fluently, not kind of speaking it or more or so-so, but actually be fluent. The UN doesn't care how you learn. Actually, I learned English when I was four watching TV. So you don't need to actually go to the UK to study at a very fancy university to do that. So whatever, whatever is the way or the mean that you use to actually learn English, that's good enough. Uh, and we are not bound by these levels of A1, B, C, that is not used at all here. Uh, because if you say, maybe I'm, I'm over-exaggerating, but if you say I speak Hungarian, well, the interview is going to be in Hungarian just to prove that you actually speak the, the language. And they're going to bring somebody from Hungary to ask you questions in Hungarian to see if you actually speak the language. Uh, so, I mean, it is very obvious for us to know if somebody speaks the language or not. Uh, so this is very important because, of course, the working languages of the UN are English and French, in addition to the official languages of the UN that includes those two, plus Spanish, Arabic, Russian, and Chinese. So ideally, if you can choose two of two languages out of all those six, that would be ideal. 
Secondly, um, we don't care about where you got your master's degree or if you have a PhD or two PhD or three PhD or 15 books that have been published. I mean, if you're an academic, an academic, a politician, that's fantastic. But for the UN purpose, it's not so much about the education you have, it's more about the experience you have. So I will encourage students, for example, those inclined to work on humanitarian and human rights issues, work with an NGO, collaborate with a civil society organization, or with the government, or even with the university, if this any human rights entity whatsoever. Because the UN, um, all, around, all around the world, we need people that is educated, that has the basic skills and knowledge, but many of those skills are actually acquired during actual work experience. So uh, if you come to the UN to apply for a job and the only thing that you have is your, your degrees, that's not going to do any favor uh, to yourself. So we need somebody with at least one year of experience. I'm not, I'm not talking about 20 years. Of course, when you reach certain level, you're going to be required to have many years of experience for, for, for entry level positions. Just we, just one year will do. So use social media, NGOs. I mean, any way you can think of, and try to pursue uh, experience, field experience, or work experience. Even as even as a volunteer uh, in an NGO, will will we'll do a tremendous a tremendous work and will help quite a lot um, with those aspirations. Um, try to get some international. Uh, experience. By experience, I mean literally anything from traveling to exchange programs, au pair initiatives, literally anything. And the reason I'm telling this is that probably most of you, I mean the students, with very, very rare exceptions, you have only dealt with Brazilian students. So, the, uh, and it's fairly easy to, to work with people that speak the same language, come from the same country. Have the same culture, eat the same food, have the same views about the world. It's very challenging to work in an atmosphere. And actually, on this floor alone, confidently, we we have people from 50 different countries. Uh, at my office in the United Nations, at one point, we have the chief from India. The supervisor of myself was from uh, the US. A colleague of mine is Chinese, the other is from Japan. We have a consultant from Brazil, uh, two interns, one from Nigeria, one from Canada. But this is a, this is a very small office, the UN Academic Impact Office. So you have to learn how to how to to you know navigate the waters of of different cultures, religions, ways of thinking. And the only way you acquire that is not only by work experience, but try to travel, even if you cannot travel for whatever reason. Or to have any international experience whatsoever, to meet with tourists, to meet with foreigners in, the, in your own university, your own city, or through whatever is the mean, or try to try to learn language. If you're going to learn English, for example, or find somebody who's actually from an English-speaking country or, or a French-speaking country that can actually teach you also about his or her culture. And I think this is critical if you if you want to work in an organization like this, where uh, by nature. As I always say, everybody is from everywhere. Uh, and I, I actually said to a friend during lunchtime today, I think I've heard 10 different languages just in three hours. And I, I love that. That, that. that for me is fantastic. The, the fact that you're in a place when you don't understand anything, I love that. Uh, and you have to, to work with colleagues that have different modes of uh, uh, you know, uh, teamwork and uh, they, they, they think strategically in a different, very different way. Because I always say I, I, I'm a Latino person, uh, so of course, as a Latino person, as a Latin person, I have a very distinct. We all have Brazilians do uh, a very distinct way of thinking that is not necessarily the same as somebody from Japan, for example. But yet we work together very well. So I, I think this is something that is also very critical, and I will advise that to all uh, students uh, aiming to work here in the U.S. That's the beauty of the United Nations, that uh, multicultural environment. Uh, yeah. That's nice. That's great. 
Well, Professor Omar, it was uh, great. Uh, the world is a vast place and there are a lot of opportunities to take action. So I would like to once again uh, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. I'm sure uh, everyone here today has learned a lot from you. Uh, thank to the audience too for, for being here. Thank very much to everyone else who worked hard for this event to happen. Uh, and I believe that with that said, uh, I therefore can close today's lecture, wishing everyone success, a good week, and uh, thanking again Professor Omar. It was uh, an honor for us to have you here and hope we can have you back here in the near future uh, sure. to hear from more from you. Thank you. Thank you.